Good morning, everybody. How's it going? Good. Good. Uh, well, I have left a message for our speaker. <laughs> I think it's on its way, but I'm not 100% sure. So we're just going to fly by the seat of our pants this morning. Okay. Um, but hopefully he'll join us and we can learn some about uh, Sophia Way today. And if not, we'll... We will oh, figure it out together. Or, uh, yeah. Mark Vermouth or yeah, something yeah, like that. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. Well, uh, yeah, I know. I tried to give helpful instructions and uh, we'll we'll see how it goes today. But I'm I'm curious how, how folks are feeling, how folks are doing. Yeah. Overall. I was just going to say, <clears throat> Sophia Way is already here, represented uh, by Maureen, uh, making uh, her, her needlework, uh, uh, the hats and things that uh, that are contributed to Sophia Way for the women's movement. Uh, we've had the pleasure, along with Mary Hinky, taking some of these items to Sophia Way to pop off. It's a beautiful much, thing. Yeah. Our circle always does nil. Yeah, once a that that well, our circle used to. I haven't had them for a while, and they need meals. So yeah, I think I saw that in the email this week too. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, my, my daughter works in Kirkland, and she's a good organizer. Who did you get for that one? The, oh, oh, for the um, Helen's place. I said we need to organize the meal. Oh, it's <laughs> she looked. Yeah, What's the one in Kirkland? It's Helen's, it's part of Sophia Way, but it's called Helen's. Like, their shelf is theirs. Yeah. But they all were patterned after Mary's place, right? Yeah. What about that? Wait, Sharon and So. That's wonderful. Do you all know how long we've been involved with? Sophia Way is one of the ones I haven't had as much of a chance to connect with as I could. As long as. Mentioned it is existed, I think. So, yeah, right? yeah. Which I don't know. But I, they talk about it at every when I, I go to represent Newport right now at the meetings. Who's going to be represented? Um, <laughs> and um, they talk about it almost every time because they always have people say how long they've been associated with Sophie. Well, I put that. <laughs> but a long time. Much like um, Porch Life. And in fact, mission and peacemaking almost cut them off of our list for a while because they weren't being as well run. Oh, oh yeah. and um, but they have come back bigger and better than ever. So oh, it's it's great. really exciting. Yeah. yeah, no, it really now it's like they're sort of like a no-brainer. Like I think we haven't shown up yet. I'm sorry. The speaker has not shown up yet. It's it's their uh yeah, and yeah, we yeah, just really they're amazing. Yeah. And sometimes that's what we all need is just a little refresh and a mm -hmm. regroup. So yeah. I'm I'm glad to hear that they're still in, still doing well and I've heard nothing but great things. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the, the work that they do. Yeah, so he's spoke at one of the meetings, so oh, great. they always have a guest speaker. Oh, that's sweet. So, oh, guests from the staff. Yes, from the staff. That's really helpful, I'm sure, yeah. to get different angles of different things. Good morning, Lynn. I've been in the life of a case manager. It was very fascinating, you know, and they talked about it. Anyway, it was really fascinating. That's wonderful. I feel like just to realize the amount of work and effort that each individual staff member goes through is so important. Uh, I wanted. Do you know how I, large the staff is now? I wanted to tell you. Are, are we on? Yeah. Um, can you hear me? Yes. yes. I wanted to tell you that Jack and I went to the. Um, volunteer appreciation lunch at Sophia Way last Tuesday and it was a wonderful event. Uh they took they sent us home with chocolate bars and 
plants and I got to, um, they, they ha had a uh, big turnout and uh, it, I, we felt very, very appreciated, uh, we volunteers. So um, this is, this is a, uh, an organization that has very near and dear to my heart. I've spent many years on this favorite charity that we support. So um, I think we're, it's worth waiting to hear from the person they bring to us. Thank you, I mean, Sharon. They were asking how long Sophia Way has been. You know, um, I think I think it was fifteen years, was it not? I think so. Yeah. I think they were yeah. celebrating. And, and has Newport been involved since the beginning? Uh we yes, we were. That's what I thought. That's what I thought. Yeah, we used to drop stuff off when they were in the. Uh, one of the rooms at the Bellevue Congregational Church mm -hmm. in its original building on Northeast 8th and uh, 108th, I guess. And, and that's yeah. where they have their offices now, and um, that's where they had the event at Bellevue Congregational. So the new, the new building on Northeast 2nd. Yeah, we should get the literature out and read it. Yeah, yeah and so for those of you who don't know, they have two shelters now, one in Kirkland and one in Bellevue. And, um, I uh, should have my facts in front of me. <laughs> they probably have all those, but and and they they like placed like 140 women in permanent housing last year, so wow. they're doing good work, you know. Yeah. So unfortunately, the need just keeps coming, it just keeps coming. And and then they have a day center too, and that's and um, as well. So they have people that just anyway. I think. I think there's like 40 at the Kirkland one in the evenings and maybe 20 something at the Bellevue one in, and then a day center. So, These are women without children? Yes. Yes. So. The families go to Porchlight. No, well, not Porchlight. Yeah. Porchlight is primarily single yeah. men. Oh, yeah. Okay. Single men. They have, there is one that's, there's a couple that take families. One's oh, right there in Kirkland, too. That one building you pointed out, and I thought it was pretty. Oh, well, they, they have those buildings. Some of them are in the house. Yeah, from the house. Mm -hmm. There's, oh, you know, mm -hmm. some of those are, are not government. Mm -hmm. But all, because they have low income housing, yeah. and then they have transitional housing, and then they have the horse light part. Chris, uh, in regards to a comment earlier that they're looking for uh, support maybe on meals. Uh -huh. And I think this would be a, a good way that we could all understand uh, maybe as deacons with our unit to say, hey, they're looking for meals. And it's sort of like uh, uh, the, the ministry units that we have if somebody's ill or there's a grief issue we can maybe ask and you can make a meal. So this would be a good thing, I think, for all these different things uh, where we can play uh, individually as a church to contribute. Yeah. Oh, the problem with that is quantity that you have. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, that's always one thing that they always, always, always need. And in the past, we always... Um, uh, donated one meal a month to them. The, the, we had different groups of the church that would would do it. It, it started off, it was the choir and it was the okay. circles and it was um, different groups. Um, and, and we always donated one a month. But when COVID came and that was eliminated, yeah. and then, but, but if, 
the person does arrive, he or she will say definitely that meals are always, always needed. Absolutely. And I think that was part of my excitement to <clears throat> use these weeks after Easter to talk about some of our mission partners. I feel like, you know, we can all kind of have our silos and the things we're familiar with, um, but it's helpful just to even know what's out there and, and what these organizations are facing and how we can get involved. I think there's a great uh, pairing that happens, uh, that should happen and <laughs> hopefully happens here at Newport of of learning and being knowledgeable, but then also putting that into action of how we can show up. That doesn't always mean that we're everything to everyone because um, we are uh, human beings with limitations and um, you know, energy and capacity that can be at different levels for sure. Um, mm -hmm. But just to know what's out there and, uh, you know, I feel like that's a lot of, of how I became passionate about certain areas in my work or ways that I've been involved um, in different organizations throughout my career as well has been knowing someone, right, who works in this or who's been affected by this. And then next thing you know, you can only see their face when you're hearing stories that sound like that. And um, you can't help but want to tell others about it and get others involved. And I think that's what's Part of what's so powerful to me about these organizations is the right people at the right time hearing and sharing those stories and, and wanting to do something about it. Right. I think it's a great lesson for all of us that we don't have to have it all figured out before we take our first step in figuring out what to do and right. uh, how we can help for sure. Yeah. Well, then, you know, to some degree. Yeah. And then they have a wish list like everybody does on Amazon. And like now they're looking for summer stuff or summer stuff, and they have a list of. Yeah. Did you say they're still doing the uh, the welcome bas welcoming baskets for folks moving into? They were they were stacked up. <sighs> Sorry, just thought a text from my annoying in-laws. <laughs> 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 yeah, they but, had a. Um, go ahead, Chris. Yes, they were doing. I think they got a good stash of them still. It's okay. The, it's the last I heard. Um, These are welcome baskets for folks when they get into permanent housing. Yeah. So like toilet bowl cleaners and you know the things you need to pick out. You know all the basics that you yeah. need to move into a place. Yeah. Those little things add up so quickly oh, too. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And when and we so we were doing it here for a while too, but um, anyway. Yeah, they're uh, one of their case managers, uh, Tia Conway. Uh, it's designated for outreach to people living in their car. So many of our, say, parking guests have had case management support from uh, Sophia Way. And that's, that's why I know that's continuing. So here's what they're looking for right now. Sunglasses, tennis shoes, flip-flops and other side styles of sandals, double bags, backpacks, underwear in all sizes. And that has to be new. I know that. Sports bra in all sizes, that also has to be good. Unopened makeup. So, um, but they take, take, they care. Oh, cool. take other clothes too. I'm also looking to connect with volunteer hairstylists to cut hair at an event they're having too. So, I you know someone that would donate that. Don't want me. <laughs> <laughs> um, but anyway, uh, they have a how to hopefully greet the person that's come. Yeah. Uh, well, I was thinking their goal is. Yeah, no, I go ahead. With our church of age and maybe not be able to do a meal, maybe if an appeal is made that they need socks and underwear to think about that. Yeah. That would be Good morning. Good morning.
Got the Sunday's next step. Right. Well, mm -hmm. we can we can we can pivot. Right. <laughs> uh, for I think Chris just mentioned it to you all, but um, I I just got a call back and he said I was getting ready to go to church and I realized I was supposed to be a different place. Sure. Um, and I said that's okay. We we've, we've been figuring out a few different options for next Sunday, and nothing, none of them have been solidified yet. So I said, why don't you join us next Sunday? So we're just going to have a little shift here, um, and still I think it's great to to be together and, and to talk about missions. So we'll learn a little bit more uh, about Sophia Way next week. <laughs> Sitting that good, because we're not late then. And they're not late. That's right. Tell me, Gina, and she thought it was very easy. You are going to do it. Pastor Kelly? Yes, yeah, um, sure. I wanted to know if. Um, as long as it sounds like we don't have a speaker today, can I tell you about an event we went to um, this weekend and a book? Have you ever heard of this book? Yes, um, Unclobber, yeah. This has been, this, our son from um, Port Angeles, who's active in the Methodist Church, gave this mm -hmm. book to us a while ago. And I looked at it, and you know what I thought it said? Unclutter. <laughs> <laughs> I thought, and I promptly put it down, and I thought, I'm not interested. We're working on it. We're working on it. <laughs> <laughs> Lo and behold, uh, this book, are you familiar enough with it, uh, Pastor Kelly, to share what it is with the yeah, group? Yeah, absolutely. I was going to say, unclutter isn't too un. Uh, excuse me, too far off from where, from where that book is. So this, uh, I can't remember who, who is the author of this one, Sharon? Uh, Colby Martin. I've never. Martin. Uh, That's right. Yeah. So this is a book, um, for those who aren't as familiar, the, um, predominantly anti LGBTQ plus, uh, theologies refer often to about six or seven different single scripture verses that they believe condemn queer folks. Uh, and they are referred to as the clobber passages, right? So kind of clobbering you over the head a little bit there. So this book is called Unclobber um, and looks a little bit more in depth at the context of those verses and gives a, a better, uh, more faithful, in my opinion, <laughs> reading of those uh, specific verses. So this is an, an excellent book. It's been a while since I've read that one in particular, but um, an excellent book, especially when folks are trying to do the work. And we've talked about this some here um, before, that most of the time people think in order for you to be progressive, you have to throw verses like that out. Um, that, you know, we, well, we just, not that one. <laughs> um, but I think, especially in, in my research and in my own life of faith, um, we don't have to throw those things out. And in fact, there is, a, I gave a presentation on the clobber passages once and said, I completely affirm what these verses actually stand for, which kind of takes people off guard because in our English translations, there's Definitely, uh, depending on what version of Bible you're reading, it might directly say, you know, and, you know, the homosexuals were condemned because of their behavior kind of uh, notion. Um, but really, most of the, the passages are talking specifically about being inhospitable. Mm -hmm. um, so when we think about Sodom and Gomorrah is normally a, a story that people use to condemn queer folks. Um, but later on, I'm going to forget which book in the New Testament it is, but someone makes a reference of the sin of Sodom and Gomorrah, referring to them not being hospitable to strangers. Um, and that is why they were uh, 
punished by God, um, not because of whatever activity was going on. Um, so a lot of the Levitical law that people might throw out some uh, hateful verses on is actually talking more about the sin of inhospitality and kind of putting yourself above others uh, versus in Greek and in the New Testament, um, which is a great plug for one of our events coming up in June. Um, in the New Testament is uh, very specifically um, there's two different Greek words, and both of them are referring to a practice called pederasty. Um, so that was an older male that had influence in the community, taking a mentee, uh, a younger boy under his wing um, to help teach him the ropes or to teach him a trade in exchange for sexual favors. So someone somewhere along the way thought that was wise to combine those Greek words and translate it as homosexuality, um, when that's not at all a reflection of what I would call homosexual practices with healthy, mutual, consenting relationships between adults. Um, that was way more child abuse. Um, and so I will directly say, yeah, I support no child abuse. I can really, I can stand on that one for sure. <laughs> Uh, but a lot of it has to do with knowing the context, which is where books like that that Sharon's talking about are really helpful. Um, and all of this to say, yeah, we're going to show the movie. We're going to show the movie. Oh, yes. Um, so I'm sure a lot of you have heard me talk about the documentary 1946. Um, this is, I think, the subtitle is uh, the myth translation that shaped culture, um, and it's a documentary about. Um, some folks who realized this mistranslation before it was even put in print, um, but it was actually too late to change the first edition of, I think it was the revised standard version um, that this came out with first in 1946. Um, but they had to wait seven years to fix their translations <laughs> uh, because of publishing schedules and things like that. Um, and so they knew that it was wrong even when it went out. But in those seven years before they could fix it in their first, you know, edited edition, uh, a lot of other more conservative Bible translations just kind of copied and pasted their work. And that's why we have a handful of different uh, Bible translations that talk about and seemingly condemn uh, homosexual behavior. Yeah. So, we, get, we got to see that, and I highly recommend it. Mm -hmm. it's, and it's so helpful because it's easily step by step <clears throat> the development of understanding it. I went with Kelly <clears throat> and others when it was shown in Seattle. Mm -hmm. it, it'll be here. Right? Yes, we're going to. So we'll have that on Sunday, June 23rd at 5 p.m. Um, we're going to host a showing here at Newport. Um, and then we're going to actually invite folks to do a potluck. Uh, dinner to have some conversation about what we learned and experienced in the documentary um, and also do a service project again kind of learning something and doing something um, so we're going to do a service project here to benefit a local organization that supports queer youth um, and we're invite we're partnering with uh, Overlake Park Presbyterian oh. and Redmond Presbyterian um, and anyone else uh, who would like to join for this event. So that's going to be Sunday, June 23rd at 5 p.m. Oh, I'm so glad it's available now. Me too. When was it we saw that? I forgot. Uh, October, I think. Yeah. 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 So it's been really neat. There have been a number of showings um, at different churches in our presbytery. Oh, wow. All of them have been over on, on the west side. Uh, most of them, I think, at Union and, and Japanese Presbyterian Church. Uh, so I said, well, we got to have one on this side so our folks can come too. And it's a great, you know, half of it is covering the scholarship and the actual like context work of proving why this is a harmful translation. Um, and the other half of the documentary is the story of the documentarian um, themselves and uh, with their, you know, conservative Baptist dad and what that looks like in relationship and how this plays out. Because um, I think in the end, you know, we're talking about mistranslations when we're talking about harmful theologies. Um, we really have to remember that it's not just, oh, we got it wrong, <laughs> um, but rather that this can do serious harm 
um, especially for our young people who are trying to figure themselves out. Um, and far too many churches um, and Bible studies and insert any kind of group here uh, make these statements without really doing their faithful work to know what's behind it or what's what's going on here. Um, and it's it's really important to remember the human side of these uh, these things as well. So that's that's my spiel on the clobber mm -hmm. passages. <laughs> Uh, you're on mute now, Sherry. Oh, on Friday night, we were with 25 people who support um, our Bruce and Deb Robinson from Haiti. And our church has gone uh, there on teams. Mm -hmm. And one of them, they're a very conservative group. And um, one of the lovely couples that we know he was sharing with me his struggle with um, how to relate to a uh, a granddaughter who was gay, and he was just you know he was just pain pained by this, mm -hmm. and yeah, that her kind of marked as going to hell. Yeah, and so uh, in an effort to try to mm -hmm. explain to him, that, you know, because he thought it was so biblical that homosexuality was wrong and i said well it's all in the interpretation and i and just the night before i had gotten this unclobber book from our tim you know he was so thrilled that his methodist church had changed their ways um just within the last week or so and um so i i wanted to um share this book with him and i intend to do that in an effort to to um relieve uh, to to open his eyes to something new um the people here are from university congregational church and from bellevue press and this a uh, person from haiti is speaking at bell press this very morning so um I don't know at all. It, it, I just thought perhaps if he would be willing to listen and and open, it might it might help him. If he would be willing to listen, I think you know that that relates so well to to this series on mission and talking about what what we're doing and who we are in our community. Um, it it really is important to remember. That you know our work with foster kids that we've been talking about with Treehouse and and Katie's work and um, our showing up for our houseless folks um, in our community. This is because these are the exact people that Jesus was befriending when he was alive. That's what his ministry looked like. Um, and I will often say that's not always going to be easy. <laughs> not always going to be popular, um, but the ways in which we are called to live like Jesus lived and to love like Jesus loved um, really helps us exactly what Sharon's talking about, of, of showing up or trying to sponsor a, a, a relationship or a conversation, um, trying to, to be mindful of all the ways that we are so privileged with our money and our safety and our health and the list goes on and on. Um, it, it's it's really important for us, and uh, though we can take it for granted sometimes, uh, you know, I even myself, I've been at Newport for you know a little over a year, and I normally forget to talk about our inclusion of queer folks, right? Because it's such a part of who we are as Newport um, that I can take that for granted and say, well, we don't really need to talk about that because we have that down. <laughs> But really, just to be reminded over and over again that this is what we're doing and this is why we're doing it. Um, and we can insert any kind of marginalized group um, in that as well, trying to, to pay attention to what we believe scripture says and who it calls us to be. Um, and that, that to me is what mission is, right? Living that out in relationship, in partnership. Um, we talked some about this with our one parish, one prisoner program with underground ministries. Um, they really focus on mutual transformation. Um, this is not us 
saving our prisoner friend Deidre. <laughs> um, this is us being transformed by being in relationship with her and writing letters. Um, and, you know, we've had a handful of letters that we've received back and forth so far in the short time that we've started that relationship. And already it's just, it's so eye opening um, and so moving. So even if she doesn't get anything out of it, because who knows what God is going to do in us and through us. Um, we already are, are better for it. And I, I think that helps a lot. Do you need more people to be writing letters? Uh, right now, we're pretty well set. We have a team of eight of us um, on the, the One Parish, One Prisoner team. And we go through specific modules and help us to learn about the, the systems that we're working within and the barriers um, as we build a relationship. Once we get a little closer to Deidre's release date, which is projected for April of 2025 right now, um, we'll definitely be uh, including the congregation more in, in what that might look like, of, um, being a support or things she might need as, as she gets released. Yeah. And hopefully we'll continue to, to share updates with you all. And, um, you know, it's, it's a fun balance of how much time it takes for us to write a letter and get it to her. And then they've been having some mail issues um, inside the prison as well. So getting letters back has been taking time. Um, so we like to make sure that we get her permission for things to share stories or um, that kind of thing. So it's, it's, it's just um, I'm not allowed to share right now. How was, once she selected, how did they select the person that just screwed the work? Yeah, uh, so the, um, the inmates apply for the program themselves. Um, lots of times it's folks who have offended a number of times that are preparing for release and they don't want to do it the same way that they keep doing that keeps, you know, circling them back um, into the same issues and problems that end them back in prison. Um, and so, uh, yeah, they, they self-select and then kind of just depending on where they are, timeline is a piece of it as well. We want to have time that we can build a relationship. So, you know, if you're getting released next week, this is not the right program for you. Um, and uh, then they also want to make sure they have a church that's in the general area that you're going to be connected to so that, again, if you need support, if you need relationship, we're in proximity um, there. And so, there are a couple different factors, and they, uh, I want to say this week, they just had their 71st church that joined um, and has a team now, so they're really, uh, it's it's been wonderful to see, and I don't know if we've mentioned this before, but the program started because they've realized there are about equal number of congregations um, of, of all different denominations and, and whatnot. Um, as there are people being released from prison. Mm -hmm. And so if we pair one church with one prisoner, then everyone being released would have partnership and relationship as they get out. Um, and we're, we're working on this it's a slow process, as you can imagine, and having the right energy and the right capacity at the right time. But um, that's, that's how this started, was realizing if every church just made one prisoner friend, yeah. what what a different world we might live in. Yeah. We're going to kind of join, we're going to slip out and join the real people. <laughs> See you soon, Bruce. <laughs> See you later. Uh, <clears throat> what the Methodist Church went through here, and I know that's very close to your heart, and how many things... Uh, just knowing how many uh, viewpoints of uh, the other side and the fact that we're all Christians and they'll know us by our love. Mm -hmm. Supposedly that is what we're trying to do. But it seems like we have this conflict of you're either with me or you're against me. Of, mm -hmm. uh, and how we can look at having the spirit you know, be receptive to listen because I think that's what I have really learned here at Newport is that if we listen, we don't say we have to agree or totally be bought in on something like that. But I'm just curious, knowing that the Methodist Church 
which uh, Seattle Pacific is part of this with their so, yeah. uh, faith-based college. Uh, how can we uh, not look at it converting or whatever? It's just how do we go about when you have this tremendous gap of acceptance? And because I, what I found in Stephen Ministry uh, many years ago, uh, <clears throat> it was men to men, and until somebody was ready to be receiving, uh, then I think. This idea of how can we give where we both grow together, mm -hmm. and it just. Do uh, you have any comments on maybe just having left the Methodist doctrine and you're part of the Presbyterian team now? Uh, where do we begin with a church that we have great friendships with? I know that uh, Jack and Sharon were there at Bellevue first, is a very conservative church. And they left to come here to hear. So it's not a case of trying to convert somebody to say, just join our team. Uh, but where do we begin? Absolutely. Uh, I'm trying to organize my thoughts because I have a lot of them. Yeah, um, knocking all over the place. I, I think first and foremost, relationship is going to be the thing that brings change. Um, think about when you've changed your mind on anything. <laughs> Uh, I was hanging out with a, a friend of ours this weekend who had a son who's really had a lot of trouble and um, he's finally doing really well. And then like factory reset his phone so that he got rid of his parental controls. <laughs> so they had to have another conversation about like, we're trying to build trust. You have to trust us. We have to trust you. Let's figure this out together. Mm. Um, and they really, you know, they, in their conversation with him about why this happened and why he thought this was his only choice and things like that, just in a parenting relationship, um, being able to have an open and honest conversation helped them understand a totally different level of what he was going through. Um, and I think that, that really makes a difference, um, being able to be in relationship. I think about the number of people I've known who've you know, changed their stance on inclusion. Um, more, almost 100% of the people I can think of, it's because they had a relationship with someone. Mm -hmm. um, they, you know, my child came out, my granddaughter came out, um, my friend, something happened um, that's close enough for them to to feel that rub, to say something about this doesn't match up. Um, and it's it's hard because we can't plan that. Um, we, we can't foresee that. And sometimes you're in relationship with people and it's not changing yet um, in, the, in the speed or the way we want it. Um, but I think that's how the real change happens. Um, and only by then do people look for books like Unclobber or, you know, have conversations with other people and say, well, well, how can you make sense of the way that I was taught to read scripture in this specific way or this version? Um, and I think that that applies across the board. I, I think I've mentioned this before. My um, undergrad university, Furman in South Carolina, is named after the primary person who made the biblical argument for slavery. Mm. Oh, oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. That was way too literal. But it's not supposed to be literal. Yeah. He responded to questions with questions. Well, <laughs> yeah, and if we do, I think it's it's wild to me too of how much if we wanted to take the Bible literally, um, it really contradicts itself quite a lot. <laughs> That's which part? Yeah. <laughs> Which creation story? Which floods? Because it doesn't agree with this book. Mm -hmm. Did you did you try and try to read the Bible about the things about slavery and things about homosexuality and things about all the things come out and they both go back and forth? It's just like one thing is true. Well, and there's no, and then and you go back to that. 
Yeah, absolutely. In this context, yeah, this is true. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think you know I reflect on um, what it was like to to be pretty heavily involved in the United Methodist Church mm -hmm. when they had their like we're tired of this taking over all of our uh, general conferences where the, everyone around the world gets together. So we're going to have one end all be all conversation, which is what happened back in 2019. Right. <laughs> um, and it it didn't match up. It did, it, folks were still really hurt. I mean, I mentioned this in my sermon last week, the things that people said on the floor recorded on a general assembly. Wow. Um, just really terrible things on every side of the issue. Yeah. Um, and so that's why I think the relationship piece is so important. I think from the folks that I know that have stayed and continue to be advocating for change, um, it required building relationships with folks on the, the other side um, and, and realizing the things we have in common, being able to share our experiences of this is why this hurts me or this is why I'm advocating for this wording change. <laughs> um, because I think we have to be able to see the, the human side to all of it. And, you know, the, the, the PCUSA has been uh, inclusive in marriage and ordination since 2012. Um, this coming summer at our uh, General Assembly, there's another proposed change for the Book of Order to be more inclusive. Oh, um, wow. Yes, I, it came from Olympia Presbytery, actually, our friends just to the south, um, trying to change the wording to include um, gender, uh, sexual orientation and, and gender identity in protected classes that's listed in our Book of Order because um, it's not currently there. Um, and it's it's really interesting to see how the conversations are already shaping around that. And some people that say, well, that's a given. <laughs> what is this actually going to change? Some people who are worried that this is going to cause more people to leave the denomination. Um, some people who are worried this will make the folks who are already kind of sneaky conservative hide their practices even more so they don't get in trouble with our book of order. Um, and some people where it would mean a lot, even if it doesn't actually physically change many of our practices, it would mean a lot just to have it included. Um, and for all those people to come together and hopefully have a faithful, honest conversation about that this yeah. summer at our General Assembly. Um, then it's a challenge for the moderator. Oh, oh yes, oh, I am not. I am not jealous of that by any means. <laughs> You know, one of the <clears throat> makeoff lectures <clears throat> several years ago was about uh, listening mm -hmm. to the other. Where, where is the other person coming from? I don't remember who it was. It was a woman, and it was so helpful. And because she had us practice that, of course, which isn't like we've never done it, but it's <clears throat> assumption. Um, and another word that I learned at, uh, at work was, I'm already going to say before they finish even saying what they're saying about where they're coming from. Mm -hmm. Assumptions, but my own agenda popping up before I even hear the end of mm -hmm. their agenda. Mm -hmm. And and it's um, gosh, it's work. Yes. Yeah. And, yeah. And, and our brains do it automatically, right? We're listening for the sake of figuring out our response yeah. rather than just understanding. It's the beauty in asking for for a little bit more time to soak in what someone just said or to think about how I want to respond to that is yeah it is it's a practice it's a muscle we have to exercise well and even our questions imply that we have there's an answer that we expect then I can give you a concrete example as a chaplain walking in a woman who and I had a young man who was shadowing me for the day and I had told him I said you know you're going to Sometimes they'll tell me that what I'm thinking is not what they're, you know. Um, but what really, what, what really is bothering me is so and so. So, mm -hmm. so we walked in to see this woman who had been in intensive care for quite a bit. Who <clears throat> had substantial lung issues, and there I was all and what are you doing? And she was kind of talking about it. Oh yeah, it was good to be out of ICU. And then finally she says, but you know what's really bothering me? And after I went to church and said, I didn't tell her. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> and 
in. But <laughs> about twenty minutes into our visit, if you could just say, yeah. It's <laughs> great. Well, friends, thank you for your flexibility this morning. Yeah. I'm still having good conversation about mission in the ways we didn't plan, but. Um, I, I'm so grateful for the, the work that we're doing here uh, at Newport, the attention we're paying to what we're doing and why we're doing it. I think that gives us more strength um, and more courage to keep being the people God calls us to be. And we will look forward to uh, hearing about Sophia Way next Sunday. Um, right. And then we'll have porch light on May 19th. Um, and then we'll wrap up our ACE classes for this program year on the 26th of May. So. Thanks so much. Thank you. Okay.